Am I sharing my screen? Yeah. 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 All right. So, uh, I know it is very difficult for everyone, okay, whether you are in US or in Africa or in Europe, South Africa, uh, South, uh, Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia and Latin America and so on. So this is a very difficult time. And um, we don't know yet how and when this uh, pandemic will be really over with us. And we have been reading a lot of um, studies, analysis, and speculations uh, concerning this uh, pandemic. And some people say it, it might never go away, okay? But some people say maybe uh, by the end of this year or uh, beginning of next year, the vaccine will come. But still, uh, we need to face our current situations. I know uh, all of our participants, uh, I mean, uh, the ones who applied and joined our Global Humanities Institute, you are either uh, junior uh, colleagues or just uh, early uh, career scholars or you are advanced doctoral students. You are all facing these career issues. Uh, some openings are closed recently. The economic might go down and um, and everything might also go on virtual mode for months. Okay. But our research and our study and our life cannot stop. So today we will need to go through how we want to continue our research and also how to modify it so that we can all be um, facilitated even and acquire a new uh, capacities for everyone and including ourselves in dealing with this um, uh, either online or uh, in the end uh, the uh, uh, physical meetings. So let me go through uh, this uh, my, our thinking okay 2020 to 21 online programs in a time of COVID-19. Of course uh, we are uh, planned or designed to establish a, a cross-regional, cross-institutional, and cross-continental humanities institute. Okay, we want to uh, get together scholars and also um, junior colleagues to work on our program, migration, logistics, and unequal citizens in contemporary global context. And as we see everyone from different corners. Either you are doing anthropological studies, you are doing film or documentary studies, you are doing um, a gender inequality or um, uh, migrant uh, or migrant and refugee uh, precarious, uh, precarious uh, conditions. Uh, this COVID-19 actually uh, worsened, intensified and exposed the vulnerability of our society. So we need to think how, how to fix um, the situation. For today, this agenda, okay, we will be um, first introduce the objectives of, of our GHI, our lines of research and maybe a slightly modified or uh, and also in the end, we want to discuss the possible channels for publication projects, okay? And also through uh, our online program that we want to um, um, start, okay, shortly. I think for all of us, okay, not only for uh, senior colleagues, junior colleagues or advanced doctoral students, research and publication should be the most important thing because we, we need to publicize our thoughts. And also we need to accumulate our research through the exchange of our uh, thoughts, ideas, or we uh, expose ourselves to challenges so that we can accumulate our research product and public, uh, publicize it. But also those will be crucial for young scholars to 
Yes. Can't hear you anymore, Yeah. Yeah. Shall I continue? Oh, whoops. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on. All right. Yeah, right. Our works, our videos, our documentaries, so our uh, 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 journal articles and everything. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about it later on. But today, uh, PI and the co-PIs will also introduce... <laughs> My friend, I cannot... Oh, oh. All right, people are joining in. Okay. And the third, we will... Uh, go through participants self introduction so we get to know one another and we also so that uh, we want to discuss suggestions from all participants or all speakers or uh, possibilities of forming research group according to participants research interests and their revised project proposal and we want to see whether it is possible to form reading groups of critical text and read, uh, and also the text provided or recommended by our uh, organizing committee and speakers. And discussion group of draft and the group members uh, manuscript uh, to prepare for presentation and also future publication. Okay. So, All right. Let's briefly, I'm sorry. Let's briefly uh, go through the objectives of our GHI. The first thing, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm a little bit awkward with this. Um, All right, the first thing is to assist early, earlier career scholars and, or advanced doctoral students to establish cross-institutional and cross-regional research teams and prepare for publication. I think this is one uh, end result we want to see, okay? But we also want to provide both virtual and a physical platform for all participants to discuss and exchange ideas with other junior and senior scholars on the research interests and concerns that they share. All right. And we want to encourage also self-initiated discussion groups as research teams to share and to discuss their projects and aim at the publication as a result. And to assist participants with the techniques of organizing virtual workshops and discussion groups for future career demands. I heard that some institutes uh, in US, they have opened up a uh, postdoc fellowship online, virtual online, virtual uh, postdoc fellows. And we don't know whether the courses that you'll be offering when you graduate would require you to do it uh, through virtual form. And we also know that uh, in uh, London, uh, the performance has been uh, moved on Zoom, okay, uh, for a, a theatrical performance. And there are other types of uh, virtual modes that maybe at this stage, we, we, we need to be equipped, okay, so that we can be adaptive. Of course, we don't want to give up our physical uh, interactions and also our, uh, our field trip with uh, local societies. But at this point, I think those will be something that we can try to provide, okay, through our activities. And conditions of migration and, pre and precar precarious life, uh, our original um, issue, and also logistic, geoeconomics, zoning politics, and local infrastructural initiatives 
those are also the things uh, we need to go into. And theoretical issues concerning the questions of unequal citizens, unequal lives, unequal and differentiated citizenship, okay, that doesn't protect everyone. So those are the, the situation that's uh, getting uh, worse during this pandemic uh, period. So those are the initial things we wanted to discuss. And we have our um, team of uh, co-PIs uh, from different uh, institutes, and we have a team with speakers, okay? And uh, together with all the speakers and also our uh, colleagues from Partner Institute and the speakers that we have invited, everyone, 35 of them, or 35 of us, have agreed to come next year, okay, for the June uh, 2021 uh, summer school. So we have planned and worked uh, in the past year uh, through our pre-institute meeting. First in uh, uh, Hu Zheming City and the second time at uh, Kuala Lumpur, we uh, discussed our program, okay, so the program uh, let us go through it uh, later on, but uh, the program, as we I said maybe more than four three or four or five times, that we want to uh, provide possibilities for publication projects. Those might be uh, special issues as uh, journal articles on selected team so selective team, uh, things and your research teams will be important okay either uh, asian and pacific migration journals inter asia culture study knowledge or it's also atlantic quarterly we have uh, worked out one issue uh, for against the day we might also work on other issues in the future and other channels we also can uh, collect articles and publish them as book forms. So we have discussed with Lulich, there's a special issue on interventions. Okay, uh, there can be one or two or three different volumes if all uh, the articles are ready. Or a Plutus Press or a Pelgrade or Macmillan. And we can also think of online web webinars, interviews, forums, video, audio, podcast, and we can also uh, provide platform for working paper series, okay, for uh, to, to be published, and also online student uh, research platform. So all those are the things we can uh, make use of. But at this point, as I said, we need to prepare for double track planning. The first one is what we are doing now, mixed forms, of institute structure, okay? That is including in-person, hybrid, and virtual. So we go on uh, this uh, virtual webinars or workshops um, from August, maybe uh, uh, through uh, the end of this year, and we do some further plan for next year. But we may also change everything into virtual form. So uh, the date we need to make our final decision is the end of February, as you were informed, okay, by Colin. That is, by the end of, of February next year, if everything is okay, we'll move on, and we welcome you here in Taiwan. If the situation is still very risky, okay, then, or risky as certain uh, countries, then we might, do both high, uh, virtual but also in-person form. But we might also uh, need to face an old virtual institute. For that, we also will need to think if we can save the travel expenses, the airfare, then we might switch some of the, these expenses to stipends for students, for your um, research team or uh, other forms of uh, project, okay, to enable you to uh, continue our discussion group and, and, and our uh, post-institute production, 
Okay, and we also need to think of uh, uh, honorarians to pay for invited uh, NGO or speakers to join uh, our team. So the courses you can go online as you have seen, okay, and all the teachers will be there if uh, everything's uh, okay next year, okay. But we are also tentatively planning our uh, webinars uh, of starting from August, okay. All those are tentative. We might do modifications, but we want to talk about migrant and refugee conditions in a time of COVID-19. We want to talk about border logistic and unequal lives. Uh, maybe Brett can say a few more about it. Uh, also, uh, for the first, uh, Rosalina can explain uh, the, the um, forum with researchers. This uh, webinar is organized by Brett Nielsen. Uh, October uh, moral panic, moral re regulation, or even right wing uh, uh, reactions and so on. Uh, will be uh, organized by Raphael from Warsaw. December, we want to uh, gather researchers to talk about the impact of this uh, COVID-19 uh, on their own research project by a group from uh, Western Sydney and also uh, Vietnam, okay. We also want to plan for a workshop with NGOs, uh, migrant worker precariality under COVID-19 uh, repatriation or migrant uh, worker and refugee rights, okay? But we still don't know whether they can make it. We plan to invite them over to Taiwan to meet with uh, local NGOs uh, and to share their difficulties and their plan. So those uh, webinars are uh, is organized by our committee and especially by Sudara and the Kenzie and uh, Rosa Slina. But we, uh, the host uh, institute, will host uh, the event. Okay. Briefly, myself, uh, I'm a comparative literature person uh, back in 1980s. But I've been teaching in uh, the uh, Institute of Social Research and Cultural Studies for the past two decades. And my my research career has moved from comparative literature, visual studies, artistic intervention to critical intuition, cultural studies, biopolitics, border politics, critical logistics, unequal citizens, um, global capitalism, internal colonialism, and uh, epidemic decolonization. I think my introduction both for the program and myself uh, has um, uh, uh, ended. I want to move on to, uh, um, let's see, our, uh, to our uh, co-PIs. I think we'll start from uh, Brad and then Rosa Slina and then Rafael, and then Sudara. Okay, I will end my uh, sharing. So, uh, so every co-PI will speak for about five to seven minutes, and then also, also John, yeah, right. Uh, to introduce yourself and your plan or, or your team, and then uh, we move on to our participants. All right, so Brett, you want to start? Hello everyone, my name is Brett Nielsen. I'm from the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. So here uh, on the east coast of Australia, it's now um, past two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I know four or five of you. Um, at uh, Western Sydney, there are a number of us contributing to the Global Humanities Institute. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Shanti Robinson, who works uh, primarily on international students and precarity in Australia, uh, and Malini Sua, who works primarily on uh, border politics in the Northeast of India, are unable to be present. 
uh, but some of the uh, participants on this Zoom meeting, uh, Marina Khan and Cecilia Chmielewski, uh, as well as Andrea Del Bono. Hello, Andrea. I haven't seen you for a couple of years. <laughs> um, we miss you in Sydney. Um, is a recent graduate of uh, our institute. Um, my own interests are in social and cultural theory. I have written extensively on uh, borders and migration. Uh, and uh, recently my research has been concerned with uh, logistics. So the contribution I hope to make to the Global Humanities Institute is by taking a logistical approach to migration. Uh, let me say uh, a few words about this. Colin, maybe you could put up the PowerPoint at this stage. Uh, yes, yes, uh, but I found that I cannot open your file. <laughs> yeah, there's some problem with your file, so. I don't know oh. whether it's broken, but I can I can show it from from your email, but uh, the the quality might be not so good, but I will try. Okay. Okay. Brett, okay. How, how, how about this? Is that all right? Uh, that looks good, yeah. Okay, okay. So I will just use this one because if I download it, I, I cannot open it on my computer. So I will just use this one. Is that all right? Yes, that's good. So, um, very briefly, there's a, 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 a debate around a critical approach to logistics now. Um, in this short uh, intervention, I can only say something like that uh, logistics is the art and science of ma managing the mobility of people and things to achieve uh, economic communication and transport efficiencies. So a uh, logistical approach to migration may seem cold uh, and technical because when we talk about migration, we're talking about the movement of warm human bodies. Uh, but I see the concept of labor power uh, as a hinge between these two aspects uh, because uh, labor power is both a commodity that is traded uh, in markets, labor markets, uh, which open onto a world market, uh, but it's also embodied immediately uh, in a, a, a human form. Um, so if we think about this hinge uh, between, the, the, between people and things, uh, uh, we begin to approach what for me is a big divide and has been a big divide in uh, migration studies, which is a migration studies oriented towards questions of labor on the one hand and a migration studies oriented towards questions of identity on the other hand. When we begin to think about labor power embodied uh, we have to uh, confront the fact that the body is immediately raced and gendered. There's nothing in this perspective uh, that subordinates these qualities of embodiment to some class dynamic given by labor and capital. It's immediately and necessarily uh, an intersectional approach as it gives us at the same time an angle on uh, contemporary capitalism and the debates around globalization associated with it. Um, we can think about logistification, which would be the process of making things logistical that weren't formally so. Uh, often in the debates, this is a concept that operates um, in parallel with the idea of financialization, which is a much more uh, 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 explored uh, concept in contemporary debates about economy and culture. Uh, but we can also think about uh, logistification. Uh, and the perspective I hope to bring 
will primarily be around the logistication of borders. How are borders working with respect to human mobilities in the contemporary world? Certainly we see changes uh, under the pandemic, uh, uh, but I would argue that borders are, are uh, social institutions, obviously that control mobilities, uh, but they can also harden and soften at the same time. Borders are not necessarily walls. They act as filters, uh, which differentially include and open up this perspective that Joyce was mentioning of unequal citizenship. Uh, they're parameters that can be negotiated through logistical processes. Uh, finally, uh, there's the Asian dimension of the uh, uh, Global Humanities Institute. Uh, we have been working from uh, a regional perspective, reaching out to look at global issues, uh, but we want to do so in a way that reaches beyond, uh, you know, the analytical areas of post-war area studies uh, knowledge. So logistics uh, gives us a way of doing this uh, by tracking mobilities between different sites, whether they be of people and things, and these do not always uh, abide uh, the uh, uh, standard uh, diagrams of uh, regionalization whether they work through international organizations or civilizational uh, ideals. Uh, so I think this perspective also gives us a way of interrogating some of those questions associated uh, uh, with area studies. Uh, that's brief, but necessarily, I wanted to say something briefly about the uh, workshop we will be organizing, hopefully for September, uh, and the participants uh, in that workshop who will explore the kinds of issues I have just laid out. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Sandro Mezzadra uh, from the University of Bologna. Uh, he's a political theorist that has worked intensely on questions of migration. Uh, I have collaborated extensively with Sandro on both uh, writing projects and research projects. Uh, the uh, uh, current project he is leading is called Platform Labour in Urban Spaces. Um, uh, it's an EU project uh, about uh, the role of digital platforms uh, in several European cities. The other participant will be Ranabir Shamadar from the Calcutta Research Group. Uh, he is again experienced with political thought work on migration and borders over Korea. Interestingly, uh, his uh, research group uh, came out with a book now about six weeks ago called Borders of an Epidemic, COVID-19 and Migrant Workers. I think there may have been a PDF circulated of this work on the Facebook group that has been set up for the uh, GHI. Uh, uh, so hopefully Ranabir can speak to uh, ask more about this project. They've recently come out with a policy document. Uh, I won't say much more about myself and I don't need to say anything about uh, Joyce because she has already introduced herself uh, more expertly than I could. Uh, so this is just a, a, a brief uh, outlay of the perspective and the workshop. Uh, and uh, I will now hand over to Rafael. Okay, uh, Raphael. Oh, I was thinking, uh, Rosalina, because I, I want you, Rosalina, to. Uh, are you ready, Rosalina? Yes. Yeah. And uh, you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll present myself and uh, very briefly also introduce uh, my team. So I um, maybe I could have um, the slide as well. Or do I share it myself? Yeah, because I don't do not have your slide, so maybe. Oh, I Google Drive. Oh, you, oh, you hear it? You, you upload it? Yeah, but oh, I cannot. So, so let, let me let me find out. Okay. Yeah. I think I should have it. Yeah, if you should yourself. Okay, okay, I got it. I got it. 
So okay. you want to open that uh, PDF file, right? It's a PowerPoint, but uh, I can just continue without it or I can share it myself on this side as well. So anyway, uh, I'm Rusa Slina. Uh, nice to meet all of you, uh, see your faces here. Um, I'm um, calling in from Kuala Lumpur, uh, where I'm based at the University of Malaya. So I'm quite uh, new to um, migration studies. I've sort of been involved more with uh, the refugee community here through aid work and community uh, work, uh, but been starting to um, do research and think about um, uh, migration issues, uh, you know, the last couple of years. And, um, you know, previously I've been working on indigenous rights issues and it's been a quite an interesting uh, lens to sort of think about a migration sort of from this other point, you know, sort of, you know, that perceived dichotomy of indigeneity, uh, which is, you know, about rootedness and stasis and then migration, which is about, you know, movement and mobility. So I sort of thinking through uh, this two uh, sides of sort of, um, I don't know, the same point, but this two um, uh, perspective has been quite interesting and I think productive as well. I'm still trying to uh, think about it and, and you know, unpack it um, uh, as I go along my research. I also been involved in a lot of storytelling types of projects. Uh, I work with indigenous communities on storytelling um, with indigenous youth. I'm uh, beginning to work with some students of mine uh, on collecting stories with the refugee communities here. Uh, and um, so we're hoping to sort of continue this process as well. Um, I have with me, um, should I just share the slide now? Um, uh, I can share that for you. Do you want it? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Because I, I, I have with, um, I also wanted to introduce my uh, team members uh, who are actually here as well. Um, so can, we can just skip this, <laughs> my picture. Okay. Uh, I'm at the University of Malaya just to, to sort of uh, center. And I'm also teaching the gender studies program. I teach things on development and social justice issues and, and so forth. Um, also work on, uh, you know, women's history, uh, unpacking sort of uh, bringing out uh, women's history and subaltern studies as well. Um, I'm, I've started a, a new project, um, you know, partly because of some of the work that we were doing last year um, with um, looking at art as a way uh, for refugees uh, in sort of building and, you know, sh showing resilience to the arts. So I've been working with Saleh Sefas, who some of you have met in, in KL also, and sort of uh, exploring that idea uh, further. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, so my other team members is uh, Hyung Hong, who is a lecturer in political science at UM, uh, USM, another university which is in Penang. Uh, and she works on history of health, um, diseases and medicine, and also um, pol the cultural politics of health, diseases and medicine, and uh, political politics of memory and memorization. So she's uh, also had, has worked on um, migration issues, documenting um, uh, on the conditions of the Cambodian female workers in Malaysia. And I think she's sort of uh, planning to work more on this in her uh, paper that she'll present at the um, uh, summer school. Um, Hyung Ho has also written some really interesting work on the May 13th um, incident in Malaysia and does very interesting his social, cultural, uh, historical work. Uh, so you can sort of look up some of her, her writing. Uh, our next team member, I'll just go very quickly, um, is Simon Soon, who's also here, and he is um, uh, an art historian uh, and is uh, also here at University of Malaya, where I'm based. Um, he's at the Visual Arts Program, and um, Simon's been sort of looking at migration more from a historical lens, sort of a very interesting work. I uh, couldn't quite read this because it's too small, but uh, sorry, Simon, I'm going to uh, butcher this a little bit. But um, one of the things that he's been looking at is the Muharram procession and sort of um, looking at the cultural history from, you know, through 19th and 20th century. Um, also, he's been looking at the the colonial history of Batik um, and also um, the 
the global circulation of indentured South Asian labor. So he takes a very interesting um, historical uh, analysis of uh, migration and mobility issues. Um, he's also very interested in the Indian Ocean history and uh, spatial visual practices. He himself is an artist and a curator and recently uh, had an exhibition uh, which actually explores some of these issues uh, in a very visual form. It's very uh, fascinating. Also one of the uh, uh, found uh, co-founder of Malaysian Design Archive, which is also a very interesting site that you can go on and take a look how uh, sort of um, where they uh, archive the visual history of Malaysia. All right, I think uh, I'll go to uh, the next slide. So our team um, had hosted um, the uh, PIs and co-PIs in Malaysia in December feels like a lifetime ago, but it was just uh, six months ago and we had a, a really productive uh, session there and sort of, um, sort of in a way, uh, not just sort of going through the logistics and trying to, you know, prepare the summer school uh, program, but it was a very productive place to think about migration and mobility issues, having all these scholars at the same place and also being sort of in the center heart of Kuala Lumpur at the, uh, where we were, um, where we had the meeting. Um, and if I may have the next slide as well. And uh, to, you know, we were right in the center heart of Kuala Lumpur, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, this leads me to sort of the context of Malaysia, where uh, we do have a very large number of mig migrant workers. Um, it's estimated that it could be as high as one fifth of the Malaysian population. Uh, though Malaysians don't like to think about this uh, or you know, try to ignore this issue. Um, we, we also have a, a good sizable population of refugees and asylum seekers um, in Malaysia. And of course, Malaysia is very much rooted in the history of migration, which again is something that, um, uh, you know, really builds actually the whole discourse of Malaysia and the, the politics of belonging in Malaysia. So I think a lot of our work, um, the people in our team, uh, deals with this, you know, it's not just about recent migration, but also sort of situating it within this larger context of historical processes. And uh, of course, now with the COVID-19, um, you know, there's already a lot of disparity um, in the mig migrant population and refugee population. And of course, it's heightened uh, this situation of precarity. Uh, we have lots of raids happening now in areas that are uh, marked as um, COVID, high COVID risk areas. Um, so we're seeing state uh, violence uh, enacted in the name of, uh, you know, uh, public safety or science. Um, and also we see a lot of uh, rising xenophobia. Uh, again, with the, with the state sort of um, sanctioning this uh, in the discourse that they're talking, in how they're, um, this, uh, you know, the discourse of, uh, you know, foreigners bringing this disease into uh, Malaysia and how we need to be aware and um, minimize risk by putting them away. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of things going on here in, in all the other countries, uh, I'm sure. So uh, these are some of the things that we're thinking about for the webinar that's coming up. Um, we want to revisit some of the people that we had uh, interviewed uh, or had um, come to talk with us in Kuala Lumpur when we had the meeting in December and sort of, um, you know, sort of get a, a bit of an update and discussion about the condition of refugees and migrants in Malaysia. So we're, we hope that we'll be able to share that um, with all of you in August. So thank you. Joyce, you're on mute if you're saying something. So Dara, do you want to follow up? I, I think we want to cover this uh, Southeast Asian and then uh, countries, and then we move on to uh, Warsaw, and then we, we move on to our uh, participants. Uh, so Dara, are you ready? Yes. I was far away. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Going last. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Very clearly. 
we, we are almost <laughs> muted when we don't speak. So oh, okay. <laughs> let me share uh, screen. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen with you so I can start. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my um, my team. So in terms of um, everyone at Mahidon University, we're based in Thailand um, and we're at the Institute of Population and Social Research and it's very interdisciplinary but also very much based in the social sciences. So in this effort, um, we're trying to bridge between the humanities and the social sciences. So um, <clears throat> next year, hopefully we can see each other and we'll be joined by Sujada Tawisit and Rosalina, uh, Rosalia Sforstino. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about them and then a little bit about myself. So um, in terms of uh, Rosalina, R Rosalia's um, background, she actually comes from the kind of um, uh, philanthropy background um, and she has many publications. She's a Southeast Asianist and Indonesianist and a cultural anthropologist by training, but she's also worked in the social sciences in terms of development uh, research. So you can see here um, Si Junction, which is um, a cultural and um, kind of think tank organization uh, that brings together many different constituents to talk about Southeast Asia, but also primarily um, around migrant rights, whether it's refugees or labor migrants, etc. So um, at Mahidon University, um, we have the Mahidon Migration Center. Um, we have several different research clusters, but I'll just focus on the kind of uh, Mahidon Migration Center. And we have a biannual conference, which has been delayed to next year. And all of you, if you're interested, please check it out. Um, and uh, it will be held, I believe, next year in October. Um, so you can check out some of our publications and research journals by taking a look at our website here. Um, you can, let me see. The next person uh, I want to talk about is uh, Suchada Tawisid, and she is um, a gender feminist scholar uh, who has for, she's um, for many years worked in Thailand and Southeast Asia around migrant health issues, women's issues around um, family, pregnancy, sexuality, identity, um, and also um, Thailand ethnic minorities without citizenship. Um, the other person that I'm working with is Tammy Robinson, and she's based at Hanyang University, and her and Kenzie Chen, um, who is a postdoc at NCTU, we are putting together a workshop with NGOs with Migrante and with um, Kabor Bumi. And I hope that many of you can join in November. This should be you know, open uh, for every, everyone to join. So she's primarily an artist-based researcher um, and her projects vary from migrant worker rights in terms of access to media production. So uh, she was, um, trained as a sociologist and she's in the School of Education. So um, I also wanted to say briefly, because we want to help um, you know, young scholars that Maidon University at IPSR, we also house the General Population and Social Studies. Um, please do check us out. We're a double blind peer reviewed journal and we are indexed internationally, and you can take a look if you believe that um, some of the research may be quite interesting for you. I'm gonna go ahead and skip to a PowerPoint now. Not sure if you can see. And this um, helps talk a little bit about uh, the framing. Can you see? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Okay, so I did want to introduce myself. My name is Sudarat Musikwong. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology, um, and I am based at Mahidon University at the Institute of Population and Social Research. And um, some of my past publications has been on state violence and media, um, issues around uh, forgetting state violence, particularly in Thailand. Um, but also it has been around migrant labor rights in and out of Thailand. Um, so I had worked in partnership with CBOs based in Los Angeles, South Korea, some in Taiwan and Thailand um, for different various projects. Some of them were um, more activist oriented in terms of migrant worker right education. And uh, more recently, some of them have been more, I guess, institutionalized type projects uh, with the ILO, um, the International Labor Organization on Agricultural Migrant Workers in Thailand. And that project should be wrapping up and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have a publication there um, with a large team of researchers. Um, uh, the project that, uh, other project that I'm also wrapping up with, um, Chu Fen Lin at NCTU and Ken Si Chen and Li Fang um, is Li Fang Liang at Donghua University in Taiwan is focused on the broker employment agencies in Taiwan and the systems that employ Indonesians, Vietnamese, uh, Filipinos, and Thais into Taiwan's um, migrant labor regime. So uh, I did want to say um, some things about uh, our perspective in terms of my research team. And I think you can see the screen if I move this over a little bit. So some of this is really about uh, refocusing and thinking about how do we define precarity and how do we rethink precarity? Um, and how do we think about this kind of tension between uh, what is a migrant and what is an immigrant? Um, how do we rethink multiculturalism? Um, in Asia, it's been a rather ex exclusionary type of multiculturalism, permanently defining uh, workers who are foreigners as migrants who will go back. Um, I think that can change, and that's some of the issues that my team is interested in. Um, so how do we think about precarity as a right conscious, affective labor, contract work, And um, my subject positioning is um, mainly as a neo-Marxist, rethinking about how do we think about flexible labor, exclusionary labor um, that happens through citizenship and racialization, um, issues about uh, risk and safety and security and how that maximizes profit making, issues around supply chain responsibility, um, and how, to a certain degree, migration regimes do depend on deportation. In terms of Suchada, she um, uh, will be teaching a, a class, hopefully, if we have this next year, fingers crossed, on affective labor um, and thinking about third world feminisms and issues of the slippage between um, sex workers, girlfriends, uh, migrant wives, thinking about reproductive labor, marriage migrants. Sorry, I didn't realize how fancy this PowerPoint is very animated. Um, so uh, her main question is how can we develop a feminist framework that integrates how we study migrant lives and think about mindfulness around this kind of gender bifurcation and has, as we start to study migrant precarity. In terms of Rosalia's, uh, her um, talk was going to be, uh, uh, is going to be on workers' contracts and ASEAN contexts, and thinking about the right of the contract, thinking about the citizen subject and frameworks that we assume. Um, developmental state structures of unequal citizenship, thinking about the ASEAN blueprint, um, and why do we think in terms of who's a foreigner, who has a right of belonging, um, through systems of visas, data identification, passports, work permits, and how essentially multiculturalism in ASEAN context has worked to be exclusionary. 
So I think, let me see if I can go back. Thank you so much. Uh, John, do you want to continue? John Hadney? Unmute yourself. Yes, I have. Hi. Okay, so um, my name is John Hutnick. I'm teaching at uh, the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Tondukhtang University. Um, and I'm going to share the screen, I hope. So where I can find that. Uh, all right, the first one. Okay, just my CV and stuff. Um, I don't know whether there's much to say about this. I've been teaching here for three years. And uh, my, my job is to try and build up the, the research capacity of our faculty, which I'm doing with colleagues like uh, Lee Thi Mai, uh, who's our other professor. And uh, she's, uh, I suppose, a key researcher in our team. And um, Zon, Win, Win Thi Hong Zon, uh, who's at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities, also here in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and a few others, Huyen, uh, Son, colleagues, younger colleagues who are, who are drawing into this uh, project. You'll see that my work is uh, largely on South Asia. If you look at this very badly formatted uh, CV, this was a CV formatted for the National Foundation. And I swear, I wanted to put this up just to make a public declaration of complaint about the amount of times in one's life that you have to reformat your CV. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, that's why it's uh, in such bad. But you have a copy of all that, right? So um, how do I change a new share? I go to the, the main one, which is uh, this, this uh, text from the PowerPoint. Um, I guess we're thinking about how we modify our research uh, after COVID-19 or during COVID-19. For us in Vietnam, it's, it's almost after. COVID-19. I mean, that's the, the thing about being here is uh, social life has got back largely to normal unless you work in the tourism industry. Uh, everybody's back at school, thankfully. I'm glad about that because of my kids. And uh, uh, things are operating. Uh, as you see, I, I mentioned a few things that are, uh, uh, have happened. The reason uh, I wanted to start with this, although um, we, we've had a lot of success, uh, in Vietnam, that story hasn't been much uh, reported internationally. I think there are no deaths in Vietnam, despite sharing a border with China, right? And uh, there, there have been a few articles circulated globally that have criticized Vietnam, saying its success was because of uh, various uh, uh, practices that are in place because of the so-called so -called regime. Uh, and, and that's not really the case. It was just a very early uh, decision to, to uh, track and trace and quarantine uh, uh, responses to the uh, people who were infected with the, the virus and also a very uh, committed medical sector um, and, and some very good community orientation. There were social programs for, for uh, all the people who were um, affected by, by the, the shutdown of schools and the shutdown of some restaurants. First of all, we had restaurants that sat over 30 people closed down for a couple of months. And so there were a lot of job losses or uh, uh, furloughs, we, they were called here as well. Um, and, but the government had put in place some um, social programs to support uh, those people. The thing is, of course, for our research, uh, and our topic and the Global Humanities Institute topics, it's the people who are not on the books that couldn't access those support programs. So an issue, a big issue was, you know, all right, there are 3 million official jobs lost. There are also many other people who are working in the um, uh, precarious, illicit or informal sector who weren't able to um, continue to, to get any income. And the issue was, was how do they access the support mechanisms without being documented in the, the tracking systems? Uh, so there's research to be done on that. And, and that's what, one way in which our, our research is being modified. I suppose. Although I must say, um, COVID is not the only problem that's, that's affecting our research. We are very much, and why we were involved with the, the 
Global Humanities Institute, I guess, we were very much interested in our research team in comparative research. So my research, for example, I'm, I'm following up on, on work on the, uh, Sunda, in the Sundarbans, on the, in the, the Delta in Bengal, and doing comparative work in the um, Mekong Delta. Now, how do you do comparative work? Well, how do you do comparative work at all is a good question too, but how do you do a comparative work when you can't travel anymore? Because one of the key things for the way in which I do research, and I think we should do research, is that you have to go and have a look for yourself in these, these places. How can we do that? Uh, of course, another question about comparative research is who gets to do the comparisons? The person who has the facility to travel, of course, which is a, a certain kind of privilege. But what I've been trying to do with research teams and what we do in our faculty is, is try to engage uh, people who are uh, the subjects of research, I suppose, to become the researchers. Now, how can they do comparative work if they also cannot travel? Um, can we do comparative work where we have people do the same research in different places and have some other mechanisms for comparing or, or what, what's the word I'm looking for? Not measuring, but, but running side by side. These kind of issues anyway are, are, are certainly on the, our agenda for when we think about uh, how we modify our research and, and what happens. Of course, also the other issues besides COVID that I was mentioning is, is for, the, for the Sundarbans in the, in the Delta, there's a massive cyclone. I mean, no, everyone, everyone also has other problems, right? And, and in this year, especially, because we've got fires and droughts. You know, there are huge fires across Southeast Asia, right, in the last couple of months, and of course in Australia. Um, but there are also like locusts and, and, and um, the last one I heard was giant bats. I mean, it's, it's not just COVID, it's affecting us. But nonetheless, uh, we're we certainly thinking about how that impacts on our research. Whether our research is on the um, precarious workers who are, are waste collectors in Ho Chi Minh City, that we work with Enda, who you met, some of you met in the, um, uh, the, the planning meeting in, in, here in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, what, a year ago now? And, Less than a year. And, um, uh, but also, how do we work with, with those that are in uh, uh, a little bit more um, high end kind of an employment in the special economic zones and uh, um, uh, the EPZs and, uh, and, and uh, the science parks, if you like, the research and development zone. There are other kinds of workers that have been affected by uh, the shutdown in, in, in transport and travel. Of course, not everyone who works in a special economic zone is, is uh, it's not only the workers who are employed in the special economic zone that we're interested in, the EPZs and SEZs, it's also the peripheral workers around those sites, the high tech uh, uh, labor and, and, and work laborers and, and workers that are there are much uh, studied, okay, by, by um, Professor Mai and, and others, but there's a whole periphery of uh, informal workers that surround these SEZs and EPZs, right? Uh, um, and there, a lot of them, are, we, we've found are, are um, migrant workers largely, um, and, and migrant workers in a, a slightly different sense um, than, than often is discussed in, in migrant studies. They are uh, internal migrants or within at least the region. So they're from Laos or from uh, Cambodia or from the Delta coming into the city areas. Massive, massive movement of people from the Dika, from the Delta into to the city here in Ho Chi Minh City. And a lot of them are working in street employment, like, I don't know, selling food for me and stuff. So really good to do research on this, but it's a good way to get into street food culture. But working in precarious ways around the EPZs and special economic zones. So because we're, we're not able to travel outside the country, we have relocated our research to, to uh, focus even more on uh, the internal migration uh, issues and around even high tech, uh, the peripheral workers that support, I suppose, are support workers uh, are around the SEZs and EPZs. Not that every worker in the EPZ is uh, working in, in optimal conditions, right? And, and many jobs are, have been lost in, inside 
the uh, production zones because a lot of the production was for um, export sales. And you all can't uh, uh, imagine how many um, discount Nike shoes are available for sale here in Ho Chi Minh City right now because they're not being exported and sold. Uh, well, there's a commodity, um, what do you call it, a glut. A glut because export had been stalled for a while. Even, even rice until two months ago wasn't being exported from the Delta. Delta mostly is rice production, although environmental degradation is affecting that massively as well. And that's another reason why many people are coming into the city. So we're working on this and that'll be the, the topic of our, our um, workshop when we get to do it, which will be, I think, December or February. Um, and that'll be led by Professor Mai and by Zon. Um, her, her work, I've given you a page of the kind of research questions she's asking. We also want to put on the agenda uh, this question of comparative work, how one does comparative work for, uh, in, in or around our issues. You know, whether in these different locations, not just the Sundarbans in India, the Delta in, in India or in, in Bengal uh, and versus Vietnam, but, but everywhere do we all share the same idea of what precarity means okay we get that from Marx and all that or, or labor or, or reproductive issues uh, so many of these these concepts we're deploying infrastructure might be another one uh, need to be thought of um, in in different contexts and we need to have a, a, a discussion about that so I'm hoping that will be a big part of uh, what we do in the workshop is there anything else I should be saying here? Um, we're very keen to, to participate in the uh, summer school. We get to see you uh, again. And we're also hoping that by then, uh, yeah, people can travel so that it's not only a virtual one. Although a lot of the things that are interesting about this period has been learning new skills like how to share screens virtually. And I'm gonna stop doing that right now. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so sorry that uh, May and, and Zon aren't, aren't here right now to, to say anything. They are uh, on a, a, a faculty retreat right now in Dalat, which is a hill station, an old French hill station, making the most of the new Vietnam government's directive, Nui Viet Di Dulic Vietnam, which is a brilliant genius slogan to rebuild the domestic tourism sector. Vietnamese visit Vietnam. So they've decided that the faculty will go on a, on a retreat up to Dalat. I couldn't do that because my kids are in school and I couldn't get that care. Okay, thanks a lot, John. Yeah, let's move on to Rafael. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Rafael, after you, then we'll need to uh, listen to all our participants because the main purpose here today is also to let them to know one another uh, in addition to knowing knowing us, but we also want to know them and know their concerns, their research. It might be very late for some of them at, at this point, uh, but we, we really want to um, complete our, uh, we want to listen to them. So, uh, Rafael, do you want to continue? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I will do this quite briefly, of course given that I was supposed to talk just for five minutes and we have a lot of other people waiting in a list in a way to present themselves. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's early morning in Warsaw. In a way, I am very much peripheral to the previous uh, speakers who were talking from Asia, Australia, so I represent the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences. This is the major research, public funded research institute here in Poland. And I'm mm, a member of our project with two other colleagues who are uh, Katarzyna Andrejuk and she uh, and she's interested in uh, my migration studies actually all of us what brought us to this project is our interest in migrant studies however articulated differently we are dealing with this issue within different interpretative frameworks 
And Katarzyna, who I just mentioned, she's interested in ethnic uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, while doing this line of inquiry, she, uh, she has been concerned with the position of Asian, most notably Vietnamese um, migrants based in Poland, or broadly speaking in Eastern Europe, because her interest also included some Vietnamese migrants based in Czech Republic, where is actually uh, a greater in terms of numbers community of Vietnamese people running their businesses. And, and she is covering this within the perspective of economic sociology. However, it has also some insights on the empowerment of those uh, migrants while uh, employed into uh, ethnic uh, entrepreneurship. Another colleague with whom we are running this Polish chapter of the project is Dorota Hall. She is also a sociologist. She is also a member of Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Her interest is differently uh, framed. Namely, uh, she is with us mainly for studying uh, issues of migrant exploitation in the EU, mm, clearly specifically, uh, specifically from the empirical point of view in, in Poland, in Eastern Europe. And she has done uh, a lot of work on this issue, mainly uh, within uh, EU Agency for Fund Fundamental Rights commissioned, um, commissioned project, like for instance, protecting migrant workers from exploitation in the EU, EU or uh, she was also uh, interested in uh, uh, reception of re refugees uh, in, in, in Poland. Uh, she was interested in studying in ethnographic way of the asylum seekers' perspectives. Myself, uh, I am I am I'm also a sociologist, associate professor at the Institute of Sociology of the, uh, and Philosophy of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and I'm interested in the societal reactions towards migrants, either in Poland or broadly speaking in. In Europe, and I have done some work on on this, mainly employing the perspective of moral panic studies as interlinked with moral regulation studies. Excuse me, instance, excuse me, Rafa. Do you want to share the slide? Yes, please. Of course, of course. I will be talking, you, you know, uh, freely in a way, not necessarily following lines of this, but it may be uh, helpful as a point of reference for audience. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I've been doing uh, recently studies on the societal reactions towards labor migrants in Britain, for instance, just after Brexit. And I've noticed that uh, why, and, I, and I, I was interested in more panic reactions, and I've noticed while studying these reactions that they are actually mainly driven by signifiers of risks and personal responsibility. Yes. So this uh, prompted me into some revisions in the moral panic studies and this will be an issue which i will be talking later during the course of our project about the possibilities of understanding different reactions towards migrants in uh, in not necessarily only in, in, in Europe, but it might be also relevant why we are studying uh, reactions towards migrants in other parts of the world, uh, within this revised perspective of uh, moral panic studies, which places more um, emphasis, not on moral substance as its core, core point reference, but instead, these uh, societal reactions are rather enacted by risk-oriented signifiers, right? Uh, as uh, employment insecurities of the indigenous population, what creates certain hostile reactions towards migrants who are perceived as those who are allegedly stealing jobs of, 
of uh, indigenous population. And this brings us also into some insights of risk, society theory and uh, about the instability of labor market in the contemporary la late advanced capitalist societies. And uh, once we are getting closer, for instance, which also might be of some interest for us uh, in the context of COVID-19 problems, and when we are trying to use, again, this theoretical framework, we see how and this is the very initial stage because under this lockdown days here in Poland, I had more time for conceptualization things. And I've noticed how actually relevant might be this, uh, this uh, moral panic strategy understood as a, as a governance strategy, which brings about strategic convergence between risk responsibility and morality, yes? And this uh, social control strategy, which sometimes uh, targets migrants as folk devils, might be also quite interesting uh, in the context of COVID-19. This is, of course, more sophisticated things. There is no time to go in more detail about this uh, situation, but this uh, neoliberal responsibility, responsibilization techniques employed by different so-called prudent citizens might be uh, quite interesting while studying reactions towards migrants uh, within the context of, uh, of pandemic. So uh, hopefully if the situation with pandemic will allow us to, uh, to arrange this, perhaps later this year, and this is the, some concluding remarks of my, uh, of my intervention here, I will be in a position perhaps to give a lecture or organize a seminar on this issue maybe in, in October and also perhaps either in November or uh, December in a hybrid manner I will be organizing a, a, a conference here in Warsaw so those of you who might be interested in attending this uh, there will be such a position either physically or uh, or via the internet, via the Zoom uh, platform and in other ways. This will be more clear hopefully in a couple of weeks once, uh, once the situation here in Europe, here in uh, European Union will stabilize to, to a greater extent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Rafael. So uh, every one of you have uh, noticed that uh, there are different research perspectives that's being uh, explained or proposed uh, by our co-PIs and our team. Uh, we will be uh, uh, uploading more information on the Facebook, uh, also on our website. So just make sure to check it out, okay? If locally we have any events that's being uh, recorded, we will also uh, upload those. Uh, uh, events or articles on the website. And we, we have uh, anthropologists, philosophers, socio sociological uh, scholars. We have also here uh, uh, artistic interventions, documentary study, uh, uh, or even filmmakers uh, around here. And also uh, involvement with uh, refugee migrant workers uh, uh, and undocumented migrant workers. and. Uh, uh, orphans with no uh, nationalities, that's, uh, that, that's a problem. We face locally, but we don't want to limit ourselves in Asia or Southeast Asia. Our problems are all locally situated, but we want to put it into a global context. So that's why uh, every one of you will address your local issues, but we, we will uh, add uh, this uh, global dimensions. Uh, through our network. So now let's uh, move on to our students. Uh, I think Colin gave me a yes, list. Yes, and yeah, so now we, we should have Chris first because it's very late in New York, okay? Right. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, do, is, there a, is there a PowerPoint, I think, that I yeah, yeah, sent? I can, I can okay. share it for you or you want to share it yourself? Uh, you can share it if you have it up. Okay. okay. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, so good good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try to be as enthusiastic as possible. I'm reporting from Brooklyn. Uh, so it's just uh, 1 19 a.m. Uh, right right here where I am. Um, so yeah, basically my, my major project is sort of an attempt to converge uh, media studies, especially new media studies with studies of migration. Um, and so it's both a sort of um, uh, theoretical or a theorization of what I call a migratory text, so personal text produced in transit. Um, there's sort of, uh, it could be immersive uh, performance, uh, self-portraiture, uh, notebooks, correspondences, um, any sort of uh, translingual mixed media, uh, multimedia, migrant produced media. Um, and so, so it's a theorization of that. And then I look to, uh, after theorizing that, apply that theory uh, to different uh, alternative refugee integration uh, models or frameworks throughout uh, Europe. Um, so I've been doing that the last three summers. And just to give you a brief idea about what I've been up to, um, oh, you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so just in, in general, the project kind of contributes to what lately has been called critical refugee studies, um, and also kind of problematizes or calls into question the industry of literary translation, which uh, contributes to so much world literature. Um, so then the next slide, I'll, um, in 2017, in the summer, I received a travel grant to kind of redraft the uh, seven year exile of Walter Benjamin. And that's actually the article that just was published in uh, Life Writing Journal um, that I had posted on Facebook. But I essentially just kind of tried to also um, converge and complicate the, um, the sort of environment of xenophobia between the interwar period and 2017, which of course, as we know, has only intensified, uh, particularly during this pandemic. And then so the next couple slides will show in 2018 and 2019, um, I was working, uh, doing field work at the Schulen Bertang Berlin, uh, which is the largest uh, LGBTI refugee center in the world, and really looking at non-narrative storytelling uh, to, um, to kind of form an inquiry into what I call the political and social uh, potential or agency for these migratory texts. And so last summer, it took me to, um, body to present some of that research from Germany at the International Migration Conference. And then while I was there, I checked out a couple of different really great museums uh, in, in the Puglia region who were also kind of thinking about non-narrative storytelling uh, to produce uh, sort of identity formations and subject identity um, formations for, uh, for refugees that kind of ended in what they called cultural citizenship certificates. Um, and then finally, um, after that, I was in uh, the north of Europe in Copenhagen. Um, and that's like the last two slides at a great place called the Trampoline House. Um, but yeah, so I, I basically, so yeah, the project is, is kind of a theorization and really actually moving away from the academy and trying to apply these things uh, to see how they can be enacted on the ground. Um, and so I'm a sort of an, I'm, I'm housed within the English literature department at the CUNY Graduate Center, but um, I'm a media artist myself. And I, I, I think I do unusual work for the English department. I'm probably more of a comparative media or media scholar. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to work with all of you. So, and those are just some major questions I had. That's great. That's great. Uh, Chris, if you need to leave, uh, <laughs> I'll excuse myself. Thank yeah, you. you. You can uh, excuse yourself. Uh, we will tape record everything. You can mm. uh, check it up later on to, to know. Thank you. I do want uh, you uh, to team up with other people. I mean, uh, all students. I think there are other uh, participants who are also uh, art related projects and also including our own uh, co and researchers they are also interested in documentaries or mm -hmm. uh, media uh, uh, 
critical studies and so on. So that, that's uh, try to bring this together. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to say too much more. I just want to say one thing, though, because you, you reminded me of something. What I'm intending to do with this great consortium is to think about how, especially undocumented immigrants, have been able to use a sort of what I call a scrapbook aesthetic to um, kind of redefine autobiography today. And they do that through uh, the sort of performance of documentary and documenting performance. So yeah, yeah. that sounds great. Yeah, right. Actually, in Taiwan, there is a theatrical group uh, helping all this uh, migrant workers to perform theatrically. Mm -hmm. And also there is uh, undocumented migrant workers work, but uh, uh, a documentary, but they cannot really uh, release their identity uh, mm -hmm. at this point uh, in Taiwan. But we can talk about it later on. Yeah, uh, definitely. Right. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, Karen, do you want to leave it? Uh, leave the, uh, yes, and the next one will be Angelica. Angelica, yes. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, good morning. It's also quite late here in Texas. I It's a little past midnight, 1230. Um, but good to meet all of you. So a little bit about myself. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas um, at Austin. Um, and Chris, similar to you, I'm also an artist. I conduct visual ethnography. So that's also something that I'm interested in as well um, in terms of my uh, research project. Um, I'm trained in um, what they call Black Studies here in the States um, and Africana Studies. I received my master's from N NYU or New York University. Um, and my undergrad was also in um, arts, uh, in, in the arts and from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so the, the, oh, can you go back to the first slide? Sorry. So the title of my, this is actually the title of my dissertation project as well, um, is afro Amerasians: Blackness in the Philippine Imaginary. Um, so this is a critical ethnography that looks at the lived experiences of a community who are currently living in the Philippines, who are known as the Black Amerasians or afro Amerasians. So these are the progeny of African-American military men and Filipino women that were sort of left behind and are currently living in the Philippines. Um, this is also a community that I consider myself to be a part of um, as someone who was also uh, born and raised partly in the Philippines as well. So um, I employ uh, life history narratives or oral history narratives um, and also autoethnography um, as a way to sort of examine how this community um, sort of form and negotiate their identities while living near militarized zones or the former military bases in the Philippines. Um, and also how they grapple with racist and gendered mythologies that sort of um, uh, marginalize blackness, right, within Philippine social hierarchies. Um, so, uh, and you can go to the next slide. So this is a photograph of one of my um, informants. So uh, these are the, the two main cities that I studied um, in the Philippines. Um, and, and in terms of my future work for CGI, um, it will address the theme of migration, but more importantly, unequal citizens, right? Um, because this issue uh, is related to precarity um, and questions of um, you know, multiculturalism and shifting identities within uh, the Asian context, right? Um, so the work that I'm interested in for uh, the theme is one that I'm calling Rejecting Anti-Blackness, um, Mapping afro Amerasians Lived Experiences in the Philippines. Um, so this is uh, something that sort of recounts, um, you know, the present day experiences of this community. Um, uh, it looks at the ways in which they're sort of disenfranchised, right? But more importantly, what are the re resilient responses? you know, from this community? How do they manifest agency and also survival strategies, right? Um, in response to anti-Blackness, prejudice and loss, right? Um, so again, it's based on a larger uh, project, um, oral history project, um, you know, as a way to sort of talk about this lesser known community, right? That doesn't just exist in the Philippines, but it's also in, they are also in various parts of Asia. Um, and when we talk about local context, I mean, this is a local issue, 
But with what's going on now, especially here in the United States, this has a global resonance, right? When we're talking about anti-Blackness. Um, so that's my uh, project. So thank you so much. Angelica, thank you. In Taiwan, there is also a lot of uh, uh, this, uh, children, hybrid children left uh, by this American uh, military base. Mm -hmm. And Herba Foundation has a lot of documents. And we have also students working on it. So it's uh, from North uh, East Asia to South East Asia, mm -hmm. all over. Yeah, there are several uh, oral histories uh, also documented. Uh, if you ever could come, <laughs> we should arrange. I would love that. <laughs> so the, some of them became seniors, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, there are other stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we move on to your yep. And next one will be Jorge. Jorge. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, I will try to be uh, very brief. Um, I'm in Mexico right now, so here is past midnight, so yeah. Um, so, well, I believe there's a, okay, there it is. Um, so hello, uh, thanks for, to everyone for being here and there. Uh, my name is Jorge Choy Gomez, I am from Southern Mexico, uh, from a state named Chiapas, at the border with Guatemala. And I am a third year doctoral student with a Latin American perspective at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, first, I would like to thank the GHI for giving me the opportunity to participate in this project. Um, it is very important for me to be able to share my research experiences uh, with people from different parts of the world um, in an academy where knowledge production is from uh, a fistful of Western countries, um, hegemonically appreciated. Um, sharing with you is a huge privilege. So as you can see on the uh, first slide, uh, my work has focused on the Mexico-Guatemala border, uh, especially with Central American migrants and refugees. Uh, I have worked with some local NGOs from some, for, for some years. Um, as a consultant on migration issues with agencies um, such as the IOM, UNHCR, UNDP. And I have collaborated with academic projects on Central American migration in Mexico. Um, but perhaps one of the defining experiences of my career has been working with the state government of Chiapas, or my state, uh, for a, a brief period of, period of time. Uh, I was part of the staff of a detention center for, for migrant and refugee children and adolescents. Um, as an anthropologist, that opportunity was uh, amazing to work inside the state and to work inside the migratory control system in Mexico. Uh, that was a very surreal experience. So if you can go to the uh, next slide, please. So um, this leads me to describe my doctoral. This, this is actually my doctoral project um, and, and the one I was accepted into the GHI. Um, I, will be, I will be working with the staff of two detention centers uh, for migrant children. One in, on the Mexico-Guatemala border in the city of Tapachula and on the other uh, in the nor northern border of, of uh, the Mexico-US border in the city of Tijuana. And in addition, I, part of my research is to examine what role and degree of influence international organizations, such as the UN and its legion of agencies, have in the execution of Mexican migration policy in these detention spaces. So, so this research is focused on public officials uh, who work on those detention centers. Uh, who are they and how are they interpret and, and, and execute uh, migratory po immigration policy in Mexico? I think, I believe that we know a lot uh, of uh, detention centers for adults, but very little is known about detention centers for children or shelters as the migratory law uh, euphemistically call them, and much less about who are the people working there and what exactly is happening within these facilities. I believe that 
uh, it's very important to know what is happening right now. So if you can go to the next slide, um, there are 33 adult detention centers and 31 for underage migrants and refugees. And the shelters or the, uh, the detention centers for children are administered by the National System for the Integral Development of the Family in Mexico, which, which is an institution, it's, it's a public body responsible for uh, coordinating the national system of social assistance for vulnerable populations, uh, among them migrant and refugee children. So um, these practices of immigration policy are not the same as the, that of the National Migration Institute, which is the main institution in charge of executing migration policy in Mexico. So the DIF, the institution that manages these shelters for children, was incorporated into, the, into this immigration control apparatus in 2011, when the new migration law was enacted. And I believe that this is, this is important. Uh, it is important to study how people who had been trained as caregivers now find themselves practicing immigration control in an institution um, originally designed for other purposes. And I believe care studies and bureaucracy studies can um, uh, are a combination that could go deep in migratory control and studies and how institutions are functioning right now in the region. So you can see in the slide where is Tijuana and where is Tapachula, there are opposite borders. There are uh, different social settings. I, and I believe this uh, comparison is very important, especially in Mexico, and especially because these um, social settings are very different. Um, on the one hand, you have Guatemala with indigenous population, and on the, on the other hand, in the northern border, you have uh, the US with all uh, the border control. So um, yeah, I think that's it, that, that is my my research project. Thank you so, thank you so much. Uh, well, we, we do need to think uh, in addition to conditions of uh, migrants and, and, and so on, we need to look at all this uh, institutional violence or uh, including police violence, legal violence uh, and the legal production of illegality at different, con uh, in different conditions. So the, uh, caretaker or uh, brokers, it might be the byproduct of those institutions. And we, uh, those are the uh, very important thing for us to really in, uh, look into how law or legal practices and institutionalization has been uh, executing this uh, 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 races or gender inequality and others. Okay, so thank you so much, especially um, Mexican border is now a very difficult uh, situation. You are also a photo uh, ethnographer, right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You, you three of you, the three of you share the same uh, concern and uh, talent. And uh, yeah, right. Let's move on. Uh, Brian. And that's when with Brian. Yeah. Brian. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone. Um, Sorry that it's dark here. My wife is sleeping, so I have. Uh, um, but if you could share the slides, um, I. So my name is Brian Tui. I am currently a postdoc at UCLA in the Fielding School of Public Health, and I'm trained as a sociologist. I have uh, my PhD from U University of Chicago in 2018. And I'm going to be starting another postdoc actually in the fall at Wisconsin Madison, also um, in public health. Um, if you can go to the next slide, um, I'm also impressed with the first three people how coherent you all sounded at this hour. So, um, but um, just just a broad, quick overview of what I'm interested in. Um, two general areas. One is. Um, the increasing significance of citizenship status. So the context in the United States, there's been, you know, a lack of comprehensive federal immigration reform since 1986. And because of that, citizenship status matters more in immigrant lives and something that I'm interested in. And the second aspect is um, issues that arise at the intersection of uh, healthcare and immigration reform. 
And so I have an article that just came out in a journal called Social Forces, um, which looks at, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act in the United States had a, uh, was the greatest expansion of social insurance in recent American history um, and lowered the uninsured rate amongst the very poor. But it, I show how it unintentionally exacerbates the differences within immigrant groups based on um, citizenship status. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in uh, my next project. So there's two things that I'm going to be working on over the next year at, at Wisconsin. One is um, there's been changes in the United States uh, to this idea of what is and is not considered a public charge. Um, and if you're considered a public charge is being is understood as being reliant on the government. Um, there's been changes in the Trump administration that accessing health care benefits like what we call Medicaid um, can make you eligible for a uh, being deemed as a public charge. And so there's speculation that this is going to freeze a, a lot of people and deter people from accessing healthcare benefits. There's gonna be a lot of negative implications. So researching that and the second um, project, uh, I'm sending out my book proposal to uh, three or four presses this, this month, hopefully. Um, and the idea of it, uh, the title is uh, Mexican Chicago Between Belonging and Exclusion. I did a five-year ethnography in the city of Chicago with um, uh, mainly with uh, Mexican American men in the first and second generation, or uh, in the 1.5 generation, which basically is, uh, refers to people that are born outside of, you know, in this particular context, outside the United States, but came before prime socialization years. And the second generation is someone that is born in the United States, parents born outside the United States, um, and. Uh, you know, while the literature rightly focuses on the exclusion that undocumented immigrants experience, um, it's also the case that there are simultaneous experiences of inclusion and belonging. And what does that tell us about um, the texture of undocumented life? And um, is sort of a couple of the themes that I that I discuss in the book. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about, just generally in in expanding my network. Um, you know, a lot of sociology and migration, it really focuses on the United States context. Um, and it's helpful in thinking about theory building and to see how these processes play out in alternative contexts. And so I'm just excited about, you know, learning about other people's work uh, outside of something that I'm mainly focused on. And just even hearing some of your projects now, it just helps me to think through some of the things that I'm discussing. So. I think that's a general overview. Yeah, very good, uh, Brian. Actually, uh, the questions of uh, a differentiated citizenship status, or uh, this, uh, and also this uh, uh, unequal health, unequal health care, but uh, yeah. unequal health <laughs> too. So that that's actually also a very uh, crucial issue uh, in in Southeast Asia. I think uh, they are all. Uh, residues of this colonial uh, history, but also the, the previous uh, nation state building processes. But of course, it's a uh, contemporary uh, globalization of neoliberal uh, marketing. And so on. Th those are uh, issues that uh, it's really shared globally. So that, let's move on. Uh, uh, I'm sure you, you'll get to know more uh, when we you, you know one another. Uh, people who have similar concerns. Um, so, Lungani, uh, Lungani, Lungani, the next. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Lungani, uh, yes, you, you need okay. to speak out louder. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, your voice is not clear, but you should be, yeah, speak out louder. Um, Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah, clear. Oh, okay, okay. So um, could you please pull up the slide? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Lungani. Um, I'm a PhD uh, student at National Jowtown University. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I'm sorry for the noise in the background. The baby is making a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so just a brief introduction. Um, yeah. Um, I graduated with a Bachelor of Military Science from Stellenbosch University um, in South Africa. And then um, in 2014, I came to Taiwan. Um, I did my Master of Science um, from the uh, from Chung University. And currently, I'm at uh, National Jiaotong University, pursuing my PhD in um, uh, 
um, at the Institute of Social Research and Cultural Studies. So my current research interests are in um, international political economy and maritime geopolitics. And more specifically, um, so I, I'm, I'm looking at the rise of China in international politics. And my research focuses on how China's sea power is going to influence um, Africa, more specifically the eastern part of Africa. My research um, also looks specifically at the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. Um, I, I would like to, to analyze the Maritime Silk Road Initiative through the lens of sea power. Um, however, I, I look at sea power in a broader sense, not just the military aspect of it, but I, I want to understand um, the sea power through a logistical gaze. And uh, Professor Brett Nielsen's work and also Sandra Misandra have been has been very helpful towards um, conceptualizing uh, logistics as power. So that's what my project wants to do, and um, I'm hoping to, um, to 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 learn a lot during this um, institute. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That's that's all that I have to say. Yeah, thank you, Lingani. So. Sea power, uh, actually, it's crucial uh, to, to look at this uh, logistical line uh, in relation to geostrategic uh, dispositive, zoning politics, and how those uh, uh, logistic, logistical lines uh, would change the landscape of power relation and also local societies mm -hmm. uh, through those uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Yes. Uh, especially uh, Africa, okay. but of course along the, the, the sea line. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, shall we move on, Halabi? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ah! So, I will just share my screen. Just a moment, please. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Um, my paper is on uh, shadow lives, my and precarity in Turkish and Indian fiction. So I thought I'll just start with a brief introduction. Um, of course, it has to be kept brief anyway. So I'm a PhD in literature from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. And uh, um, I examine translated texts in my writing. I'm, uh, I specifically look at private museums um, that address local concerns. Uh, so I look at the museum as a space of performativity that I approach through literary texts. In fact, I was at the, the, the GHI last year at the University of Chile, where we, we discussed challenges of translation, which are actually so uh, necessary for migration studies as well. Um, in fact, uh, as of now, I'm also in a discussion group on female migrants and refugees in South America at uh, uh, a university in Colombia. Um, so I have uh, worked with university centers as well as I have a long career in book publishing as well. Uh, so I have worked with uh, the National University of Singapore where I lectured on the minor in art history. Um, and I have also worked with the Center for Contemporary Art at Nanyang uh, Technological University. So um, yeah, I am, so a lot of my research deals with translated texts, private museums, as I've already mentioned, erasure of collective memory in migrant history. Uh, I'm also a visual artist and I use urban sketching and photography to get into the skin of cities. I also publish poetry and I have, uh, a number of poems on the city published as well. Um, I'm now expanding my research to Asian Latin American collections. I'm currently looking at texts from uh, 
Sao Paulo, Istanbul, and Delhi. Um, so, so yeah, this is my new interest. This is one of my sketches. I just thought I would uh, introduce a little fun element in my, That's my presentation. Yeah, so this is old Delhi. Um, so in this uh, GHI, I would like to look at uh, narrative fiction, displacement, othering, cross-cultural connections, um, and uh, the precarious lives of migrants from subjugated subject to unequal citizen, from village migrant to city resident. Um, I'm looking at everyday architecture, shanty towns, informal labor. Um, and I would like to do a close reading of a selection of literary texts which I feel are bridge the perceived imaginative distance between cities. So I am considering um, so far Orhan Pamuk's The Red Haired Woman and A Strangeness in my, my mind, both of which deal in great measure with migrant histories, um, especially in minute detail. Um, yeah, and and yeah, I'm interested in complex, polyvalent, contradictory city architecture. And um, I'm also publishing a couple of articles on uh, uh, the private museum. I've also lectured recently at uh, California Lutheran University on the subject, and I will be lecturing at the University of California in Santa Barbara later this year, virtually, of course. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Pallavi. Uh, it's fantastic uh, bridging this uh, migrant experience through uh, imaginary text, uh, fiction, mm -hmm. and art, and, and so on. So, we look forward to hear more from you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mar thank you. Mariana? Marina. Yes. Ma Marina, yeah. Uh, Marina. Yes. Marina, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, Marina, that's right. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Marina. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I'm um, based at the Institute for Culture and Society um, at Western Sydney University. Um, I don't actually have a PowerPoint presentation, but I've got a document which, I mean, just has a sort of brief overview of my research. Um, I'm currently in the third year of, I mean, just sort of started the third year of my PhD project, um, and it's called uh, Mapping Migrancies, um, Analyzing Migration Trajectories Through Infrastructural Encounters. Um, and what this study seeks to explore is um, how skilled migrants navigate and experience migration infrastructure. Um, and this involves like the sort of new and emerging kind of um, text on infrastructure that deals with regulatory, um, humanitarian, social technological um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, technological and social um, infrastructure um, and also commercial migration industry. But um, I guess my, my focus specifically in this, in this sort of study is um, particularly on migrants who self-identify as skilled um, within more sort of contemporary and skilled sort of contexts such as, um, so cities like, so the research field work was based in um, Canada and Australia where um, sort of recent policy has been quite sort of broadly about, quite extensively about skilled migration and uh, economic migration. Um, and so how do these migrants sort of move to these places and what sort of infrastructures do they employ? What sort of, um, and how do the, they navigate those infrastructures as well? Um, and sort of the considerations that are kind of going in there are um, these ideas of aspirational infrastructure um, that sort of shape decisions and planning and, and strategies that migrants employ. Um, and also this kind of um, area of skilled migration infrastructures that is very particularly focused on these really transient migrants who are, um, who are sort of don't identify as, as being, you know, as they identify as being these global sort of nomads and don't have a sort of sense of settling in one place and kind of are constantly on the move. Um, and that's kind of broadly um, what the sort of group is. And they're from all over the world as well. 
So I recently completed my field work, both in Australia and Canada. And a part of my field work is also sort of looking at digital forums. Um, and there's like one forum, one sort of migration forum from each of these countries. Um, so it involves interviews, um, uh, mind mapping activity where migrants draw their journey out for me, um, out for the project, and then uh, a big data analysis of um, the migrant forums where these discussions are happening as to what kinds of infrastructures are employed. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at at the moment. I'm just beginning sort of my writing stage. And yeah, that's kind of probably it. That's interesting. Yeah, I think many of you are very much uh, equipped with uh, digital forms, right? New media and also this uh, mind mapping, uh, big data, the algorithm, everything it is so interesting. And also uh, infrastructure, uh, of course, is so closely related to logistics, how things are moved and also the question of mobility and immobility okay that uh people are facing uh, uh when they cross or connect can cannot cross the borders um let's move on uh the chi i guess mm -hmm. uh, hi everyone can I speak out louder uh, your voice yeah okay uh Cohen, could you please share my one page slide yeah, thank you. Uh, I try to make my introduction briefly. I was born in China and now I'm doing my PhD program in Taiwan in the Department of Social Research and Cultural Studies in National Jiao Tong University. And my research interests include uh, zone studies, urban rural relations, land reform, and economic democracy practice. And I'm now also working on a pro documentary project about the little theater movement and the artistic community practice in post-war Taiwan. And my ongoing project for this workshop titled The Passage Between Socialism and Capitalism, Experiments of the Special Economic Zones in China. Um, basically, it is about the economic reform in China since the late 1970s. I try to analyze how the China government prepared for establishing the market economy from up to down. The main method is to build up some special economic zones in many cities, especially in the uh, southeast coast of China. And the, the special zones, uh, which refers to the enclaves in its territory for attracting foreign investments, and it is a very hybrid time because the whole society has experienced huge transformations and it also left many um, problems too, like the labor issues and the environmental issues too. And my, my most interest is to understand how the government conduct the economic exper uh, experiments in local scales and then make them as the national policies. So uh, this process from a local to a state is very interesting to me. And the policy making process was quite different from the Western countries or even in the developed uh, Asian countries like Japan and Korea. So um, this is my research and I'm glad to share it here. And I'm really looking forward to see you in person next summer if we are lucky enough. Yeah, thank you. All right, Li Qi, uh, she's actually a, a also a documentary film uh, maker. Uh, she, she has done uh, quite a few uh, very nice films already. But this uh, controversial issue of this uh, spatial economic zone, especially uh, developed under this uh, go out strategy, go out policy uh, in this uh, post-socialist China and moving toward actually 21st century. This is something uh, also deserve uh, uh, close analysis. So there's a geostrategic uh, implementation in several uh, four cities, okay, or industrial park. Uh, it, uh, also highlights also Southeast Asian countries and including Taiwan and and uh, South Korea and, and so on. So perhaps you, if we don't really meet up <laughs> in Taiwan, we need to learn a way to share our uh, digital art or performance uh, through Zoom. But I hope we can really uh,
do our discussion face uh, face to face. Next one, uh, Stella. Yeah. All right. Um, hello, my name is Stella from the ANU in Canberra, Australia. My research is about female migrant women in South Korea, particularly focused on Filipino wives with the Korean husband. I submitted my dissertation in March and waiting to hear from my examiners. Meanwhile, I teach at ANU. Introducing a little bit about myself, I was born and raised in Korea, studied in Australia and Costa Rica, and have worked in several countries. Based on my work experience and research that I have provided many opportunities to study and work close with the women, I strongly believe that women's reproductive health and rights must be respected. My research explored how the Korean state and society pressure migrant wives to be a Koreanized. Their residency, finances, and status in their families is tied to their ability to reproduce both biologically and culturally. Migrant wives are expected to not only have children, but to raise them with Korean cultural values. Many Filipino wives are challenging this expectation and creating a new space for multiculturalism in Korea. I was able to bond with my research subject, as I am also a migrant wife in Australia, and by virtue of my husband's race, in Korea society, my family was classified as a multicultural family while we were there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you have a very wide uh, uh, transnational experience, uh, but also this uh, migrant marriage migrant uh, is also one a very key issue uh, across the world. I would look forward to hear more from you. Uh, Yanis? Yanis. Hello, hi. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. okay. Okay, let's. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Yanis Saddam Alwash. Um, I'm a geography PhD student at uh, National University of Singapore. I'm on the human geography side of the discipline, it's not called geography, cultural geography. And my background is in uh, comparative politics, political science. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. So uh, I came back to Taiwan in mid-January to do my uh, the fieldwork component of my PhD, and I'm quite fortunate and privileged to be here, trying to make the most of this opportunity uh, to complete my fieldwork. So I'm doing research on the employment journeys and labor relations of migrant workers from Indonesia. I try to focus on a number of key moments and encounters. Essentially, I'm interested in learning about what happens when people who migrate abroad to work face all kinds of employment issues, and as a result of these issues are no longer able or willing to work for the same employer. So that is both from the experiences or perspectives of the workers themselves, but also of the actors, institutions, and bureaucratic procedures that kind of uh, mediate and shape uh, these possibilities for the workers. And uh, to frame my research, I draw on a range of uh, ideas and literature that focus on labor migration and experiences of precarity, but also mostly like some of you on the different kind of ethnographic work on infrastructure that extends uh, kind of material dimensions of infrastructure to understand social relations and migration, which also helps me to understand the state differently as well. And um, my fieldwork has kept me productively busy despite the current pandemic, traveling to all parts of Taiwan to interview workers, NGOs, government officials, and employment agencies and labor brokers. And I'll probably continue to do so until later this year as I start writing my thesis. So I'm happy to be part of the group and I'm looking forward to the next steps. Very good, thank you. Uh, maybe we should really move on faster. I don't need to, I, I shouldn't say too much, uh, but it's so interesting. Uh, migration infrastructures and everything, with logistics and so on. Uh, maybe we should really move on. Uh, Andrea Del Bono. Yeah. Hi, um, so good morning everyone. I've seen Sunrise while listening to your introduction, so that was um, quite poetic. It's 8 a.m. here in Italy where I'm based. Uh, my name is Andrea Del Bono. Um, I received my uh, doctoral degree at the end of 2016 from the Institute for Culture and Society, Western Sydney University, so it's great to see um, faces and hear voices from um, uh, colleagues from the ICS and to uh, meet new one. Um, so my PhD was an ethnography conducted in the city of Sydney, um, investigating the relations between ethnicity and the city filtered through 
um, the practice of place branding. So I was looking comparatively at the application of ideas of ethnicity to the development of two precincts um, in the city of, of Sydney. Um, so upon my, the completion of my PhD, I returned to Italy where I grew up uh, and where I currently live. And I began uh, to conduct research independently in the city of Prato. Uh, so Prato, you might have not heard of it because it's not a, a, um, a very well-known city, but um, its neighboring city, uh, which is Florence, uh, would probably sound more um, familiar. Um, it's a city with which uh, Prato shares its uh, southeastern borders. Um, the city of Prato has received a lot of attention from uh, social scientists, um, mainly due uh, for the um, outstanding presence of um, a big uh, Chinese migrant population um, originating from metropolitan Wenzhou um, in uh, China's Zhejiang and working in the local textile industry. Um, so very significantly in line with my um, research interests, the, um, the city authorities launched um, in 2017 a plan uh, for a future city, which is very attuned um, to um, current uh, demands uh, of cities being sort of resilient and responsive to um, um, uh, health emergencies like the one we're living. So the, the new plan for the city is based on uh, the application of green infrastructures and um, it, it, it puts a big um, um, emphasis on the role of the creative economy. Um, so interestingly, um, there are many infrastructural uh, interventions that are planned with this um, branded vision and one of the uh, mostly targeted district is exactly the one where um, you know the Chinese uh, two generations of Chinese migratory and uh, entrepreneurship um, you know uh, migration and entrepreneurship have, have left their traces um, so making of this kind of district a very um, contested urban spot for the debate on multiculturalism in Italy, but more broadly on um, Chinese migrant labor uh, in, in Europe. Um, so in this context, I'm kind of, I'm interested in, in posing questions regarding um, uh, the nature and the meaning of creativity um, uh, in this kind of new uh, zone in politics uh, in, in, in the urban context. And I'm also interested in understanding if, if this is a vehicle that promotes kind of cross-cultural interactions or, or otherwise creates new, um, uh, you know, uh, tensions and separations, um, uh, but also based on, on class division. Um, so I'm very excited to be uh, part of this group and I'm looking forward to, uh, to knowing more about your research and, uh, yeah, yeah, and your profiles. Thank you very much. This is actually a, a, a situation that's getting more and more uh, uh, intense uh, around the world, not only in Europe, but in Europe uh, or Italy. Or, uh, it's more uh, 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 clear. Uh, there's uh, new migrants, uh, and also there's a tension with local communities, maybe tension, but maybe, uh, and also the, the developed entrepreneurial network or a shadow economies uh, that, that might incite uh, local reactions. So, so thank you so much. Um, Antonio. Antonio. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, go ahead. Antonio. Hi, hi, everyone. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Anton. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Institute for Population and Social Research, Mahidon University in Thailand. But now I am uh, uh, go back to my home city, Yogyakarta. Uh, I am beginning of my field research and a little bit my background before I took this uh, PhD. Uh, uh, I am mostly working with NGO Indonesia, uh, national and also international, in East Timor. And then I conduct uh, several uh, research issues related with the development, community development, and recently uh, immigration issues. Okay, can we go to the second slide? Go look. Yeah, uh, this is the title of my uh, 
PSG research, the negotiating gender rules, the Libyan father and migrant mothers of Kurifan village, Central Java. So my focus is mostly for the uh, migrant family, left behind family, especially the father that stay at home uh, with children and the community. Uh, at Central Java is one of the region in Java Islands uh, where most of the Indonesian migrant worker uh, come from originally. So uh, I, I, my research will will have uh, will look the the way for Libyan and fathers and migrant mothers negotiate their gender rules related also the setting of culture norm and gender ideology in Indonesia. As you know, in Indonesia, gender rules have been contested over time, reflecting change in social economic condition, religious, and interpretation and state ideology. So this is the context the uh, the gender situation that I will. Uh, explore how the change time for time and how it will relate with the the way that uh, Latvian father and migrant water negotiating the gender rules. My research also respond what the professor called to conduct more research on how Latvian father adjust their masculinity identity, practice and domestic power dynamic in the family. Especially in Indonesia it is needed to respond to the increasing number of migrant waters as you know uh, almost 60% of Indonesian migrant worker uh, are women. Uh, well, I will conduct uh, an interview, observation, and document analysis in the one village in Central Java. And can we go to the next, the last uh, slide? Sorry. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Already 125,000 international migrant worker in 2017. Uh, the number uh, slightly reduced uh, last year and this year, but mostly still uh, uh, dominant of women. 60% uh, they are women, and uh, there are some issues, social problem related with the family left behind, uh, especially the Latvian father. Uh, difficulty with the reversal of the rules income provider into that of caregiving parent. Uh, also, the, the the situation in related with the marriage, the high divorce, uh, the high divorce increase in several parts of the uh, Indonesian uh, 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 origin place for migrant worker. So that's why uh, uh, I I I will focus uh, using the masculinity perspective to see the construction of masculinity play a crucial role in shaping men's attitude toward violence against women. Uh, as you know, uh, it's one of the issue also among the migrant family. Uh, in, uh, also related with the care of the children, manage the uh, remittance, and other issue that related with the other Libyan family like uh, the grandparents and the, the parents. Uh, also, uh, the, there is an NGO uh, on community already initiative to uh, to to work directly with the single father, work with them how to do uh, some practical tips on how to raise the kids, managing the remittance, etc. Uh, in related with the COVID, I I already got uh, uh, some information from the community. Uh, there are issues related with domestic work, domestic violence. Uh, as you know, uh, during the COVID, already 35,000 Indonesian migrant workers went back to Indonesia, and the number still increased, I guess, uh, because some of them also at, uh, end of the contract uh, after the Eid uh, al the Muslim uh, uh, celebration. So this is the, the real situation that I will have a look during my field research. I hope I can conduct uh, soon after I could... Uh, permission from the uh, local uh, uh, village because of the COVID situation. That's from, from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's 60% uh, uh, of migrant workers, uh, women migrant workers have to leave home, or uh, left their children behind, their husband behind for years. It's not only one or two, but uh, maybe uh, six or 10 or even more longer. And there are, of course, uh, huge uh, issues, uh, problems that we need to look into. Not to mention this COVID-19 uh, condition. So, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to the result of your... And, 
next one should be Marcia, but I don't think she's here. Right? Do you have, no. is Marcia here? No? So then we will have Samuel. Okay, okay. Samuel? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Samuel. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, specifically, I research on borders and migration, most especially as uh, it concerns human trafficking and youth of migration in Africa. Uh, my PhD thesis was focused on exploring the coping strategies of other communities vis-a-vis uh, cross-border insurgency and of course uh, that's uh, Boko Haram insurgency in the northeastern Nigeria and in the process uh, I got to think through ways in which uh, social and ethnic cleavages in border communities could be used for economic integration and uh, social cohesion in Africa. Uh, I'm also interested in advancing the course of uh, border communities based on what I found out, uh, that they have an age long history of marginalization and neglect by the government. Uh, my field of interest cut across borderland studies, peace and conflict studies, development studies, migration and refugee studies. I have also published in uh, high impact factor journals, which can be accessed online. A uh, few months ago, I was part of an EU funded project, uh, which was focused on carrying out an impact assessment on uh, info migrants. Info migrants create content in a bid to dissuade uh, irregular migration through the Sahara and uh, across the Mediterranean into Europe. And as a result of that, we're able to interact with some migrants, some returnees, and intending migrants as well in Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Eritrea uh, in Pakistan, and some other places. And uh, the project is completed now, and the reports have been uh, submitted for GHI. I intend to explore the phenomenon of human trafficking, most especially trafficking in women, which uh, over the years seems to be insurmountable in Africa. Uh, secondly, I intend to question the appearance of uh, human trafficking as a form of new slavery in this 21st century, where Nigerian women and children are sold for labor and sexual exploitation, whether they know it or not, and then lastly, I aim to look at how digitalization can be used as one of the strong measures to distribute this uh, barbaric act in West Africa and uh, in Nigeria in particular. Uh, I want to say thank you to the organizers of this uh, project for this opportunity and privilege to be on this team. And I say that I look forward to a resourceful engagement and uh, collaboration with scholars and colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Karen, you lead the, uh, uh, yeah, the moderate. Okay, so um, I don't think Sean John is here, so then we will have uh, Joan Shaha. Shaha? Joan Shaha? Are you here? No. I see you here in the list, but you have to demute your your, your device. Shahab. Shahab. Are you there, Shahab? You are in mute. Uh, yes. So we can speak. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Jawad Shahab. Uh, I apologize for not being able to submit any uh, slide. 
because I was struggling for, for my traveling from uh, Thailand to Afghanistan hmm. and it took many days. So I'm going to brief. So my background is in economics, either in study and also in research. Uh, but uh, recently I started my PhD study in uh, uh, Mahidun University of Thailand. And hopefully, and I, uh, I'm going to uh, have my thesis in migration. And also, uh, I'm interested to have uh, research in return migration, Af Afghan return migration from uh, uh, different countries in the world to Afghanistan because there is many problems arise when return migrations uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, because from the security point of view and economics point of view, we have many difficulties in Afghanistan. Therefore, return migration will face many problems. In this regard, I uh, conducted a research uh, about the socioeconomic situation of return migration in Afghanistan. As I already submitted the abstract, I'm going to see. Actually, I, I nearly to finish this research and hopefully would be able to uh, present it to the CH, uh, CI in Taiwan, hopefully next year. <laughs> so uh, in migration, I, I, I had not uh, conducted research, many research, but in economics uh, felt I had uh, many research in Afghanistan and recently I moved to migration because I'm very interested to work in this field. Yeah, and also before I start my PhD study in, in Thailand, uh, I was working as a assistant professor in Kabul University of Afghanistan in the Faculty of Economics. And we thought to establish a new department of demography study in this university. So that's why I'm uh, starting my PhD in demography, especially in migration field, hopefully. Thank you so much, just a very short introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Next will be Poonam. Poonam? Not working today. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm Poonam Sharma and I'm from India. And I currently stay in Taiwan. I have been here for the last six to seven years. I've received my PhD from uh, Department of Social Research and Cultural Studies at National Ch Chao Tung University, at Taiwan, in uh, 2019. That is last year. Can you? Can you hear? Yes. Uh, can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I received my master degree with a major in sociology uh, from the Institute of Sociology, National Tsinghua University, again in Taiwan. My central research area focuses on the migration of irregular and illegal migrants as unauthorized vote banks in South Asian nations. My research interest also includes um, citizenship policies, border politics, theories of nation states, and earlier, uh, I worked on impacts of colonialism in the contemporary Indian society. Uh, Colin, can you move uh, to the next slide? Okay, the title of my PhD thesis was The Invisible Politicized Roles and Religious Disorganization of Bangladeshi and Nepali Migrants in West Bengal and Northeast India. My future research attempts to critically study a larger Asia which is to focus on the complex but crucial diasporic communities of some Asian nations, uh, and which I have also, uh, also started working on. 
that is unequal socio-political situations of uh, migrants, uh, while em emphasizing on ethno-cultural complexities and sensitive colonial traces of some part of Asia, this research will form a curative study among different uh, South and East Asian uh, countries. And uh, Colin, to the next slide, please. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, GHI, uh, GHI 2021, my, the, the paper that I'm uh, looking forward to uh, present is also part of my thesis, the uh, which is titled The Invisible Politicized Roles of uh, Bangladeshi Migrants in Northeast India and West Bengal. This is a qualitative work conducted to underline the problems faced by not only the migrants, but also the native Indians due to the political roles vested to my irregular migrant communities. This paper will answer the question how the contemporary migrant crisis-like situation combined with anti-immigration laws and policies has given rise to a situation of fear, hatred, and com confusion in the society. And uh, those are my slides, but I'll speak something about my current research. Uh, I'm focusing on how uh, legality or being legal is uh, being redefined in the light of questioning citizenship and citizens. I argue how there exist various tools uh, um, employed to justify uh, legality through political defined legal ways. Uh, recently, I have been working on the turmoil of internal migration during the time of COVID-19, that is uh, currently, uh, in India, impacted by the nationwide uh, lockdown, which was implemented as measures uh, to prevent the virus. And I'm also willing and looking to looking forward to broaden this research to understand how this pandemic will impact the lives of migrant, migrant communities, not only in India, but also internationally, because it will do surely in the future, uh, because things will not be the same again. Uh, what kind of new turns the existing inequality and subjectivation of migrants will shape in the post-COVID-19 period is something I think we should, as uh, social scientists, look into. And that was all about my research. And I'm very glad and thankful to the CXCI team that we could have this uh, online forum and uh, get to know uh, each other and introduce one another's uh, research prospects and areas. I hope to meet you all in 2021 if this pandemic subsides. And thank you all. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. So I, ju I will just go on. So we will have Monica next. Hello. Monica? Yeah. Yes. Uh, can. Hello? Yes. Okay. Can. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, my name is Monica Verma and I'm from uh, India. Uh, I received my bachelor's and master's degree from University of Allahabad, Uttar Pradesh, India in 2010 and 2014. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student at Junior uh, Institute of Social Research and Culture Studies, National Chotong University, Taiwan. Uh, so my, uh, my PhD project title would be uh, The Plight of Refugees Under the Secular Democracy, uh, a case study of Rohingyas in India. So uh, my research interests are uh, like mi migration studies, refugee and forced migration studies, uh, international re uh, relations, defense and strategic studies, and unequal citizenship and mi minority studies. Could you please uh, to the next slide? Okay. Uh, what is uh, okay? Uh, so um, I, I'm going to present the paper. The title will be "The Plight of uh, uh, Refugees Under the Secular uh, Democracy: A Glance of Rohingyas Refugee in India." So um, uh, India is one of the most populous secular democracy in the world. However, India is struggling uh, to resolve the refugee crisis over the past decades. Uh, in India, the lack of effective legal framework to protect the refugees and the denial of particip uh, participating in international organizations such as uh, a uh, 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol relating to the status of refugees creating, uh, creates a precarious conditions uh, of identity crisis of refugees. The paper will be examined the plight of refugees under the secular democracy in India, both in humanitarian as well as the legal perspectives. Um, 
so I'm working on uh, Rohingya. So they are st uh, stateless, uh, ethno-linguistic, and religious minorities in Myanmar, and becomes the more uh, persecuted ethnic groups in the world stated by the United Nations. Could you please the next slide, please? Uh, okay. Um, they are a group of Burmese uh, Muslim peoples from Rakhine State and. Uh, in situated on the western coast of Myanmar, as uh, adds adds to the Bay, uh, Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean. Although the Constitution of India is uh, structured to guarantee the rights of every person to live in India with the freedom of life and liberty, so the article will be uh, discussed the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 and the analysis of the driving factors behind the exclusion. <laughs> We see my migrants under CEA. And the, finally, I'm also a uh, little bit discussed about the humanitarian agency UNHSR to pro promote the understanding and of refugees issue and their efforts towards the refugee status determination in India. Uh, could you please uh, do next? Okay, so uh, I'm extremely curious uh, and thankful to, to, to be the part of the CSCI to 2020. I believe the program uh, Migration, Logistics, and Unequal Citizenship in the contemporary global context will provide an excellent opportunity for scholars to working in the field of migration and um, exchange the ideas and therefore broaden the scope of this region. Thank you so much. This, this is what I have to talk. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so last one, we will have the video. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, are you able to pull up the slides? Code? Yes, just a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, congratulations on everyone for hanging in for two and a half hours. This is um, uh, actually surprisingly interesting for uh, on Zoom. So it's been wonderful to meet you all. Um, I received my doctorate from the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney Uni in 2018. Um, and my thesis was entitled The Challenges to um, Arts Leadership in Policy and Practice for a Multicultural Australia. So I'm very interested in what um, cross-cultural, intercultural and multicultural art practices might look like. And I'm hoping to bring that to this um, research project. Um, I'm currently working, doing a number of uh, research projects at the Institute, including one on UNESCO and the making of global cultural policy, uh, and quite a series of research projects based in very local scenario, kind of the other side of the coin, if you like, on cultural infrastructure in, across greater metropolitan Sydney. Um, I've worked at the Australia Council for the Arts, so a lot of my um, uh, experience across the arts comes from a long time doing policy research there and development of policy in the arts, which is um, lacking in Australia now. Um, I'm also a curator, including uh, not too long ago for the International Symposium on Electronic Art in Dubai. And I've got a chapter coming out in a book shortly uh, artists' activism in a cultural policy void, and that's um, going to be probably a book that hasn't uh, a topic that hasn't been addressed in Australia for a while, which is uh, around policies and institution and practices in the Australian art field. Can we have the next slide, please? So, what I'm interested to um, look at here with the research, my proposal for this um, event, and apologies for the typo there, conviviality, creative expression, and interculturality. So the, how artists generate new developments in creative expression when they're exploring diversity uh, is often created as a result in the context of mobility. So I think that's, that's where uh, it intersects with the topic of this research project. And certainly in Australia, and I suspect to most other places, the, uh, what the artists are trying to do is a, a number of things, reach towards a conviviality and increasing kind of understanding 
between groups in society, but also ones that have the potential to transform symbols within society. So in this way, it's sort of listening to the other people speaking previously um, raised with me the ideas of um, diaspora, the relationship within Australia and South Asia and South A East Asian in terms of art practice. And uh, to this end, I had suggested that I uh, continue my uh, research with Shakti Shakturadan, who's a writer, musician and composer, and now a theatre maker, um, who talks about uh, the relationship of a multi-generational art uh, event, you would have to call it, between uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Australia. And then also um, the work of the Contemporary Asian Australian Performance Company, who specialise particularly in different forms, some experimental practice as well as more traditional theatre works. So that would be, um, I think, an opportunity to connect with other topics of people that are um, presenting. And through two ways, through the idea of the, the practices as a kind of didactic role, but also then practices as um, kind of iconoclastic, I think. So the transformative element is about breaking down borders. And as I say in, this, in quoting Singh, that you present new arrangements of culture and power through art practice. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. And Thank you. before we go on, I, uh, one of our invited speakers joined us today and is Mr. Wang Yu Susino from Migrant Care in Indonesia. Maybe we can uh, invite him to speak something with us because he's the only one of our speakers joined us today. All right, Mr. Wang Yu Susino, you can speak. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, time for uh, invitation uh, uh, to join this course. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, even uh, to make uh, research, to make uh, deeply uh, inquiry about the migration uh, and social uh, issue. I'm working at uh, migrant care at my uh, organization. Uh, have uh, some uh, activity like uh, because the care is abbreviation of uh, C is uh, counseling, uh, E is uh, advocacy, uh, R is uh, research, and E is uh, education. We have uh, also uh, we have uh, also office in. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, and now we advocate uh, related with the COVID-19 issue. We uh, advocate about the issue of securitization approach uh, for uh, COVID-19. Uh, yeah, this is my shortly introduction uh, about uh, uh, me and uh, my organization, Migrant Care uh, Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Do we have uh, other speakers? Kevin. Karen. Uh, yeah, no, we don't have any other speakers. So, okay. Okay. all right. Yeah, yeah well, we need to leave time for our discussion. But apparently, we have yeah. uh, uh, heard all these uh, creative uh, interventions from different scholars. Uh, uh, we have uh, artistic activism, NGO intervention, we have a border uh, 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 analysis, but also we notice that there's a governmentality, okay, is uh, uh, exposing itself, especially during this COVID-19. And also, uh, uh, maybe we should, I, I should stop here. <laughs> I tend to uh, say say things uh, that, that that touch me, but uh, we said that we have a few questions we want to discuss among participants. Um, that is, how can we form uh, 
discussion group or research teams among uh, people who share the sim uh, similar uh, interests or concerns. Uh, there is a st difficulties of time zone, right? We, we noticed that this uh, friend, our friends in the US, uh, now it's uh, actually past midnight, like uh, two o'clock, two and a half already uh, after midnight. And um, how do you want to do it? Can you form among yourselves? I noticed several interesting uh, issues. Uh, one, of course, art, okay? Digital or media uh, uh, interventions. But of course, the other would be uh, in interrogation of this uh, governmentality, uh, logistics, uh, legal um, uh, execution of illegal and even uh, uh, symbolic violence, okay? And also there's a very uh, lack of uh, uh, consideration for uh, stateless persons or uh, undocumented migrant workers or undocumented uh, orphan of these undocumented workers and refugees and so on. So how do you think we should uh, uh, proceed uh, from this point. Uh, I would like to hear more from our uh, participant. Do you have any suggestions? Or our uh, colleagues too. Yeah. Or Fisa, you have any idea, suggestion? Uh, one idea was, uh, as I mentioned before, that maybe we can have like the clusters because the participants have already given us their cluster preference, their top three cluster preference. So we can maybe uh, arrange them accordingly. Uh -huh. Or the other idea is uh, maybe like because uh, we can like have like another survey of like how they want to do it. Just give them clusters and then they can like choose again, like different clusters this time. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Could it be based on like methodological focuses of, of people, like based on what methods people are adopting and... Yeah, who's speaking? Oh, sorry, this is Marina. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, sure. it's too dark, yeah, my camera's yeah. off. Yes, but yeah, yeah, I was wondering if it could be based on um, people's methodological focus. Mm. Both methodological or thematic uh, mm -hmm. concerns uh, could could uh, make a difference. Um, so I, I think uh, FISA's proposal, uh, that is a survey for people to select their preferences. Uh, then we advise them according to their time zone, but they may people might even want to challenge the time zone if they find um, there's a group is so interesting that they want to participate. But uh, why don't we try, maybe Karen and FISA can try to uh, circulate those uh, questionnaires and you can pick up your preferences. Uh, we, we can sort out se several um, thematic issues, uh, then they can, um, uh, select and see how uh, people can get together. Uh, then they discuss among themselves. We can provide free uh, Zoom account. Uh, I think Colin can do that for us. Uh, are there other suggestions or preferences you, you can think of now? I just want to say that uh, the time zone would always be the problem because uh, we have a lot of people live in different places. So sometimes, for instance, this time people live in the U.S., they have to sacrifice, they have to stay late. And But maybe next time um, the people in Asia, people in Europe, people in Africa can sacrifice a bit. So then that would be the proportionally that would be not to 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 hard for people living in 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 the U.S. because if we want to have a a meeting earlier, not 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 at midnight, then the people live in Africa and Europe, 
will wake up in the, during the midnight. So that would happen all the time. If we want to have this kind of a group meeting, a larger meeting, but if we separate in different smaller groups, then maybe we can arrange different time and that suit everyone. Yeah. Yes, I think there are two different uh, modes or tracks. Uh, one would be a student formed a uh, smaller group. I guess uh, five or six people uh, could be good. Okay, that, that depends on how many uh, people are sharing the same interests or concerns and they can, uh, they want to uh, stay together and discuss. So uh, the, the possible uh, program for this type of uh, discussion or research group could be uh, they share their project uh, and they also could share their uh, the critical readings they are interested and then uh, at, at some point when they have their manuscript, we, when we share, we can also invite some of our uh, invited speakers to participate so that their project can be uh, commented or discussed by uh, a larger group, but that uh, also need to be uh, time zone uh, compatible. The other track will be the uh, online program we want to organize. I think uh, that, that has to uh, be uh, determined by the speaker's location uh, because some of them might be uh, migrant workers, uh, 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 NGOs or refugee camp NGO or shelter uh, activists, or they, they might be scholars from um, uh, Italy, India, and so on. when we line up, then we, we have to pick up a time that they can be can work for them. Then for those events, we will all tape record, or not tape record, we will record them and upload. Then we can have discussions uh, uh, on Facebook. Uh, uh, I think they can follow up those uh, discussions and exchange ideas. So those are the two different tracks we can uh, experiment. Um, so, but I, I think, are there uh, suggestions from uh, participants? Uh, because this is a real rare chance for us to get together. Next time, maybe you can do that in groups. Uh, uh, Pallavi, uh, Andrea, Shahat, and uh, Who else? Uh, Cecilia, Anton, do you, want, you have any suggestions uh, as to how to continue for maybe a small group? Um, yes, yeah, Cecilia, please. This is just because it has been very interesting listening to what everyone's had to say, that maybe what we could do is um, just have one paragraph of now what we're thinking to achieve because people having listened to the discussion and also what's being suggested um, as the topic areas might have something else that they're interested to pursue and yes. just one paragraph that we then share and kind of regroup around that i just feel a bit i don't want to commit myself to anything i'd like to keep it fairly um uh you know usefully open for a while yes because we've actually got a bit of time now so it's nice to use it yeah right 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 i don't know if anyone else what they think about that idea yeah i think uh we also don't want the program to be too demanding or too uh mm. time consuming for every one of us it seems that we are having parallel several parallel lines uh uh, uh in the in addition to our daily life uh um calendars and so on so in terms of, sorry yes. can i just add yeah. something to what cecilia yeah. just mentioned i think <clears throat> um um as the organizers uh might have a better overview of um, all the participants kind of research interests and presentation i personally i think that um yeah i, I think writing a little uh paragraph or more specific kind of um 
list of, of, of research interests might help, but also like if we could, you know, divide them up into kind of larger clusters based on your understanding of where the, um, the, uh, uh, this forum sort of might head towards in, in terms of like um, bigger, uh, bigger themes and bigger issues so that whose interests yeah, align more with issues of yeah, governmentality or like development rather than um, you know something else might be able to sort of join that cluster rather than something uh, some other um, uh, research group. So yeah, an interplay of sort of like yeah, the organizers putting up a series of clusters and participants sort of writing down and sort of aligning to. Um, according to what their research interests are um, and be yeah, selected that's also might help. Mm -hmm. Any other suggestions? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, over the, the course of the last few months, my own research interests have, uh, you know, have taken a new direction. So I would like to use uh, 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 the groups here to you know sort of enable more of a discussion of preliminary findings as well as uh, you know focusing on our own um, uh, research projects which were which are already in development so so yeah I would really um, appreciate uh, being part of uh, uh, more than one or two groups um, at different times in the year yeah sure. that's yeah. great that's great. Any other comments or suggestions from the floor, from the screen? I think um, one way we can do is that we uh, circulate. Um, all participants can submit uh, their maybe revised uh, project and also their current uh, concern or interest. Okay, and then we group. <laughs> then we group then uh, into maybe several categories, uh, and then uh, any one of you, if you want to participate in two groups, that's fine. That's great. Okay, but we us maybe three or four thematic groups. Um, then uh, you can discuss among yourselves uh, after reviewing or uh, browsing people's uh, revised project because uh, even for us, our project have been uh, modified because uh, there are uh, new issues we have observed and we have been uh, thinking and reading. So it is very natural that uh, this has to be uh, modified so uh, we, we can give uh, everyone some time to for them to write up maybe a paragraph or a, a modified a project or some uh, uh, keywords they are interested in. and then we try to set up um, uh, groups and then uh, it has to be coordinated among yourselves I mean in terms of time or frequency we don't need to have too tight a schedule but when we have, for example, uh, even one time people can share their uh, digital media work, artistic work uh, online, maybe uh, two months from now, maybe everyone wants to participate, okay, uh, this, uh, but, uh, or poetry or uh, literature or a film or documentaries and so on. But also maybe sometime people want to discuss logistics and the governmentality and uh, uh, legal violence and institutional violence and the byproduct of all this uh, legal pro uh, procedure that creates uh, illegality and, and so on. Those are also possible. So uh, the, the main purpose is really not to uh, enforce any uh, structural pattern uh, upon uh, everyone, but to enable people to to see uh, some sort of grouping that's possible, so uh, mm -hmm. you will discuss among oneself, one one another. Can I jump yes? in here? Yes, yeah, sure, um, please, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to say first of all, I, I really got a lot out of listening to everyone's um, um, positions or research or uh, topics and so on. 
And in that respect, I'm kind of uh, both caught between, yes, I don't want to have lots of my time uh, consumed by this other life uh, on screen here, because um, uh, I've got research to do, but, but also I don't want to miss any of the, the things, right? Um, what I, I want to suggest is that um, for, for making small groups, and they, they, you, many people could join and you could be in multiple groups, I, I like that, is that we use the Facebook um, page that FISA has set up to suggest groups, right? So um, Marina, I think it was, suggested that we might have one group around methodology. And I suggest that you, 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 you suggest that on the Facebook group, become the coordinator for that. I'd certainly be interested in that one. Um, but I'm also interested in one in logistics and one in on uh, something else was mentioned, ethnographic, uh, photo photographic ethnographies. You know, all of those things are groups that I would join, but a person should maybe, maybe take responsibility to start a small group. And we, we put a, a suggestion, I want to start this group on the Facebook thing, see who joins. But if you don't get anyone joining with you, you know, maybe you've gone a bit too far off the spectrum. But I think we've got a number of themes. I just, myself, I want to join them all. That's good. That's good. Yes. But what we can do is that after collecting everyone's uh, maybe revised uh, project or a paragraph of what they, uh, their current concern is, then we can sort of uh, show uh, maybe a mind map or landscape or whatever it is. Uh, that uh, that surfaced from people's uh, projects, then uh, then uh, we can tentatively recommend. But then uh, participants, uh, you can uh, uh, push forward and see whether you want to do this or that, and whether you want to join both groups, the theoretical groups and uh, video or visual ones or other things. So. Would that be okay? Yes. Uh. Can I just add one more thing, Professor? I was just wondering about uh, the possibility of having a sort of online gallery uh, just for our internal viewing, wherein we can share our uh, visual art, sure. photography, sure. documentary sure. stills, and so on. That would be great. That would be great. Do you think? Uh, Facebook can uh, serve the purpose. Shall we keep the Facebook uh, uh, very exclusive just to our... Yes, of course, uh, just to us, yeah. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can do that. Uh, mm -hmm. If we want to announce our activities uh, for outside uh, audience, we can announce it elsewhere. But for this Facebook group, whatever a small group discussion or a workshop that has uh, been done, we can also record it and upload it so people can view it. But also we encourage uh, all participants and speakers to share their recent writings so or their recent their, uh, photo uh, essay, video essay, and so on. Uh, would that be okay? I think that, that could stimulate every one of us. Every, all ideas could stimulate every one of us, yeah. Um, I think we did a great job today. <laughs> I didn't expect that it would take us uh, three whole hours. <laughs> I was thinking, we were thinking two hours, but uh, always it, this is uh, difficult to really uh, foresee. But uh, I think everything turns out great. So uh, we'll uh, leave maybe uh, Karen and Fisa to help us to collect all these uh, materials and then we do some preliminary sorting, then we circulate and uh, ask people's opinion about it. All right? Great. So uh, maybe uh, just uh, keep, uh, uh, maybe uh, the Facebook, we, we will announce things, okay? And also our website and so on, but also through email, All right? So otherwise, uh, I think we can call it uh, a day and Take care. Be safe, everyone. Okay. Thank you, and, everyone. Yeah. And enjoy good morning. Your good night Bye. and good afternoon. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye, you, everyone. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.
Yeah, we discovered many bye. new talents. Thank you yeah. very much. It was we very open. interesting. Bye bye. Be safe, bye. everyone. Bye. Thanks for the good organization. Good yeah. Event. yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Paul, bye bye. <laughs> All right. Okay.